net zero is effectively depriving yourself of well-established technologies. You know, if wind and solar are cheaper, become cheaper than other sources, well, you know, great, we'll use them anyway, and we, we don't need a net zero target to do that. The act of putting yourself under a net zero target is depriving, voluntarily depriving yourself of well-established technologies, and as such, it, you know, it is impossible that it, it cannot enrich your country simply to deprive yourself of that. Um, I'm Andy Mayer. I'm the IEA's energy analyst and occasional COO, which means as well as analysing energy issues and markets, I'm responsible for the lovely air conditioning in this building, today provided by coal-fired power. <laughs> as a result of the government's wise decision to invest in solar panels as the solution to all of our energy needs. I've also previously been the green energy advisor at BP, uh, the energy company and BASF, the German chemical company, where I coined the expression the green growth paradox to describe the effect that net zero policies had on manufacturing. And I note that BASF plays a starring role in Ross's new book, um, described as leaving uh, Europe for China, or at least radically downsizing, as a result of the policies of many governments. So before I properly introduce Ross, I need to do some housekeeping. And first of all, I need to inform you that this excellent book, uh, Not Zero, is available in the lobby for a price that is not zero, uh, <laughs> but a bargain of £20, and unlike government promises on the climate, it will stay at £20 for the duration of the event. I'm obliged to inform you that the event, both the distribution, or discussion and the Q&A will be recorded. We will be releasing a video of this event on the IEA's YouTube channel, and we'll begin the proceedings tonight with an interview. I will be talking to Ross for about 20 to 25 minutes before moving to Q&A. And just as general politeness, if everybody who's got a mobile phone can turn them on to silence or to airplane mode. And otherwise, uh, apparently I need to inform you that the ladies' lavatories can be found by exiting the Selden room and turning left and making your way through the garden. So exit there, exit there. Lou's over there. The gents are just there and upstairs. What about trams? Well, we are a very broad-minded employer. And if you choose to identify in any way, such as male, female, trans, then you are very welcome to use whichever toilets you feel most comfortable with. Uh, if you identify as socialist... Anyway, moving on. <coughs> so I'm delighted to introduce our guest speaker. Ross Clark is a journalist who writes extensively for The Spectator, The Daily Telegraph, and The Daily Mail. A former winner of The Spectator Young Writer of the Year Award, for many years he wrote The Thunder Column in The Times. His previous works include The Denial, a satirical novel, The Road to South End Pier, One Man's Fight Against the Surveillance Society, and a book cupboard of one's own, The Housing Crises and How to Solve It. His most recent work, Not Zero, the topic of today's book club, is a must-read for all those involved in the climate debate and devising climate policy. He lays out the litany of internal contradictions implicit in the policy of net zero and its many potential unintended consequences. Ross, thank you very much for being with us this evening. Well, thank you. So, just a nice easy start. I mean, this is a cracking read, and I've um, spent most of the weekend uh, reading it and then rereading it again uh, yesterday. And you start the reader at COP26 which, just to remind, was the point at which Boris Johnson was Prime Minister, the peak of his pomp, part of the blob, rather than being victimised by it, allegedly. And at that point, net zero was becoming the zeitgeist in this country. So could you perhaps summarise uh, what net zero is and why did this book need to be written? Um, <clears throat> well, not zero is the policy of trying to achieve um, carbon neutrality by the year 2050, i.e. any carbon emissions we have, uh, uh, lingering carbon emissions at that date, should be made up to, by balanced by negative emissions through carbon capture and storage and so on. But um, I, I was really driven to write the book because of the manner in which um, the policy was thrust upon the country with virtually no debate um, and no vote in the House of Commons. It was pushed through as a statutory instrument 
Um, there was a vote in the House of Lords and uh, there was an amendment put in there saying, well, where is your um, workings? Where have, you know, where, it, where can you show that you, how you're going to achieve this? But, um, you know, that, that amendment was passed. But anyway, Lords just nodded the thing through. It, I, I think um, a lot of uh, lawmakers think it seems ve very sort of vaguely worthy thing to do and, and doesn't really... But aren't you being a little unreasonable here? I mean, it's quite hard to calculate this stuff, and lawmakers are busy people, and if they had to calculate every consequence of their decisions, would anything really ever get done? I think this is the most consequential issue, over, going to be the most consequential issue over the next three decades. I think it's far more significant than Brexit, for example, and we know how much uh, emotional energy we all expounded on that. And yet... You know, not even a vote in the Commons on this issue. And I, I think um, a lot of MPs didn't realise what it meant, what the implications would be. They were just relying um, on this one trillion pound figure that the Carbon Committee, uh, the Climate Change Committee, had fed them, um, which seemed to be pretty well off the top of their heads. Um, when the Treasury tried to uh, calculate a cost for. Um, net zero it refuses so we can't do it it's too many unknowns too many technologies which haven't been invented or scaled up we can't you can't um know how um we're going to achieve it so um but it seems to me it's a high point of idiocy is um committing yourself to a target which you don't actually know how you're going to achieve or what cost and just to be clear a trillion is the cost to the uk not the global cost. The trillion pound was the um, what the climate change committee sort of said that was going to be the level of investment required um, to to achieve net zero. But um, an MP's um, committee report later um, suggested that this re relied on a series of heroic um, um, hopes, you know, heroic assumptions, which um, probably won't come come true. And you, you cite in the book that National Grid averred from the Committee on Climate Change this figure and came up with three trillion, which I think also is McKinsey's figure. Yeah. Well, that, the National Grid came up with a figure just for decarbonising the grid. I mean, there's a lot more to net zero than simply energy and electricity. But yes, when the National Grid tried to come up with a figure, they suggested three trillion pounds of investment. But, you know, there's other things, there's steel making, there's cement making, there's farming, there's fertilisers and all very, very difficult industries to decarbonise. And, um, uh, you know, no figure was put on those by the national grid. Well, I think we'll come back to that. But one of the key arguments you make early on, if I may summarise, is that you believe the UK is trying to solve climate change in one country, or at least appears to be acting in that way. And you cite the difference between the UK approach and that of China and Russia as two key examples. Could you maybe expand on that? Yeah. I mean, when um, Britain passed the, the net zero commitment, it was in the hope that it would inspire the rest of the world to uh, um, you know, pass their own similar laws. I mean, I think at date, um, about 17 countries have um, passed a legally binding net zero target like we have. Um, they exclude China, America, the two world's biggest um, carbon emitters. And, um, you know, it doesn't look as if, um, they, you know, Biden or um, Xi Jinping have any intention soon of um, legally committing themselves to this target, even though they might have you know, a similar target written in some policy document somewhere. It's not the same as uh, actually passing a law to oblige yourself to do something. And the, you make it clear in the book that China's commitment is to get to a level of decarbonisation uh, per unit of GDP. So there's a link between decarbonisation and economic growth. And is that, that's a different position to the UK's, isn't it? Yeah, yes. Yeah, so in the near future, I mean, China has set itself an ambition. That's, that's as far as it goes, an ambition to reach carbon neutrality by 2060. But it has set itself a series of closer targets, but they're linked to GDP. And they say, well, you know, we'll allow ourselves so many emissions per unit of GDP. So basically, we're allowing our economy to grow 
but we're trying to clean the economy at the same time. We're, you know, we are not going to put ourselves in a straitjacket. We're not going to, um, uh, you know, end economic growth in the name of um, achieving net zero carbon emissions, which is, um, you know, what, what Britain effectively has done. Which is extraordinary, isn't it? Because while in the European Parliament in the last month they've had 300 activists all debating degrowth as a serious prospect, in the UK the official policy of both the government and the opposition is that economic growth matters. And it matters, broadly speaking, from a not necessarily free market, but social market, capitalist economic perspective. Yeah, we, we, I mean, yeah, the, the Green Party here is committed to degrowth, but um, as you say, the two main stream parties um, still hope to achieve growth, but they have this a rather Panglossian approach to it of, you know, invest in net zero, it creates, you know, all these green jobs which wouldn't exist otherwise, and it'll all somehow bring down the cost of um, electricity and power and so on. Well, what I say to that is um, deprive, uh, net zero is effective depriving yourself of well-established technologies. You know, if wind and solar are cheaper, become cheaper than other sources, well, you know, great, we'll use them anyway, and we, but we don't need a net zero target to do that. The act of putting yourself under a net zero target is depriving, voluntarily depriving yourself of well-established technologies. And as such, it, you know, it is impossible that it, it cannot enrich your country simply to deprive yourself of that. So when Ed Miliband says that they can create 500,000 new green jobs, however so defined, mm. is it your suggestion that he is perhaps being a little bit economical with the truth? I just passed him on Westminster Green, by the way. He was being mic'd up for an interview. And being, I, I, didn't, I felt it was a bit rude to stand by too close to see what he was going to say. But, um, yeah, um, you know, it, it, it's all... Create a, you know, 10,000 green jobs might sound great, but it's of no consolation really if in the process of doing so you cost 100,000 um, jobs in the, the old economy, which, you know, we could end up, well, end up doing if we export our manufacturing. And, um, I mean, there's one thing which, I mean, maybe we're going to go into anyway, but um, the way this target is expressed is just territorial emissions. That is emissions which are physically spewed out within Britain. Um, it excludes aviation, it excludes shipping, and more importantly, it excludes emissions made elsewhere in the world in the name of creating consumer goods, food and other things for UK consumers. And you, you sort of work through it logically, you realise what the government has done is just set itself this very perverse incentive to offshore all our manufacturing, offshore all our food production, because you export that, you export our carbon emissions with it. It doesn't do the planet any good, but it, um, it, it helps your own carbon budget. And, you know, th this is what really worries me. Well, we create a few green jobs here, which are mostly sort of regulatory jobs, from what I can work out. It's sort of, you know, telling people they can't do this, can't do that. But at the same time, you know, we, we face losing effectively most of the remainder of our manufacturing industry and a lot of our food production. In the Netherlands, as we know, you know, the government's actually actively trying to close down a large part of its farming um, industry. Well, it makes sense if your aim is to reduce your national carbon emissions, but at absolutely no benefit to the planet whatsoever. I mean, I feel that particular point personally, because one of the jobs I had to do at BASF was go up to Paisley, uh, where a factory had existed for about 70 years, um, and prepare them for the communication strategy they had to put in place for radical downsizing and eventual closure. Um, and I got into the taxi, and I was on the way to the factory, and uh, chatting away to the taxi driver, and saying, you know, what do you do? And so, well, work at BASF. He said, yeah, that's where I used to work. Mm -hmm. But now this is all I can do. And yeah. that was a very difficult few days. And then obviously they tried their best to invest in making that factory one of the most efficient in the world. But they couldn't compete with Korea and China. Mm -hmm. Which perhaps leads me on to a slightly different point, which is when we're looking at industries like steel, 
to a lesser extent concrete, cement and other things. Can even with the net zero policies put to one side, does the UK really have a future in heavy manufacturing? Yeah, well, I mean, it's a perfectly valid question. Obviously, net zero and carbon targets are not the only influence on why we've been losing manufacturing industry that's been going on for, for years and years. But, I mean, we do have, um, uh, you know, a larger manufacturing industry still than a lot of people um, think. Um, and um, in the case of BASF, um, which you know as well as I do, they um, uh, you know, specifically said, well, we're not going to invest anymore in Europe because of the price of energy and uh, the green policies, uh, you know, pushing up the price of energy, and they're going to build a £10 billion plant in China instead. You know, that's a direct switch of um, investment. And, um, you know, as we know, the power they're going to be using in China will be, a lot of it will be coal power. To, you know, the, moving the manufacturing in that case to China, in many cases, will actually involve a net increase in carbon emissions if, you, you know, you're going to be um, using coal instead. And another point, actually, and a geopolitical point is, um, uh, you know, China, uh, what's made in China at the moment, um, China has shown no interest in following the West's um, boycott of Putin's oil and gas. On the contrary, imports of oil and gas from Russia to China have increased. So, you know, there's a circular thing going on. If you're buying stuff from China, you're, you're actually sort of circumventing your own, um, your own sanctions against Putin's oil. One of the other points you make is that by making the target legally binding, we have created a situation where activist groups, NGOs and others, can sue the government into upholding the laws that they themselves have created, which has had the effect of creating a ratchet even where industry is successful, like the North Sea, for example. Mm -hmm. um, these things can be incrementally shut down or at least sued into submission such that the costs aren't worth it. Yeah. I mean, do you see that increasing or do you see the government no, doing something about it? There's absolutely no infrastructure project the government can undertake now, no new licenses for oil and gas extraction, which will not attract a legal challenge um, from activist groups. And, you know, and that they will start winning. Well, they already have started winning. The Court of Appeal um, actually put the kibosh on the third runway of Heathrow before the Supreme Court overturned that. Um, last summer, the, um, the, the High Court ruled that the government's net zero strategy is not tough enough to uh, achieve the target which it set itself. So the government's had to go away and rewrite it. And um, well, the rewritten version doesn't exactly um, you know, provide much in the way of um, encouragement either. So you know, everything government does from now on, it will be subject to multiple legal challenges because of this um, legally binding net zero target. So all of that said, clearly there are an awfully large number of people out there promoting their particular technology as the solution to this problem with various claims made, for example, about renewables being nine times cheaper than gas was at the peak, or gas mm. power rather, at the peak of the crisis. Um, are we being too pessimistic about renewables, carbon capture, nuclear and other things? I, mean, I have nothing against green energy or you know, any other technology like that. But I'm, what bothers me is, is the other side, where we're voluntarily depriving ourselves of the established technologies. And, you know, I'm not against government investing in, in um, you know, green technology, for example, for a certain period and so on. But, you know, it's got to the stage where you see it with green energy, with the wind and solar. I mean, all we're doing is encouraging more and more wind and solar plants without ever dealing with the fundamental issue with wind and solar, which is its intermittency. And what do you do when the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining, uh, which happens quite frequently. The wind is not blowing at the moment in Britain. And, um, you know, the sun's shining, but it goes down every evening. And we're turning on coal plants. To, uh, and, you know, a, a wind and solar-based grid is just simply not practical without either a backup, at the moment we're largely using gas, or with storage, 
um, or you know some kind of global grid where you're shifting vast amounts of electricity around the globe on the basis it's always windy, it's always some, sunny somewhere. But you know those things, they're extremely expensive at the moment, um, which is why the market doesn't want to really invest in them um, beyond a certain level. Um, and you know we've got this sort of perverse thing. We're heading towards this sort of cliff edge where the government wants to entirely decarbonise the grid by 2035, and cannot tell us what is going to happen then, when the wind is not blowing and the sun is not shining. It simply has not. But can't we just load solution. more Canadian trees into tracks? Well, yeah, yes, that seems to be a, the, um, <laughs> the 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 the. Uh, um, wood pellet um, industry uh, has a very uh, um, very good PR operation which managed to persuade the government that it was um, carbon neutral in some way. And I mean, here's how, how silly it is. I mean, if you cut down a tree in Canada and you ship it across the Atlantic, you burn it in Yorkshire and generate electricity, that's zero carbon. If you plant a tree in Britain, that's negative carbon. Well, something doesn't quite add up there, does it? I mean, if you're, it, you know, it's simply, it, it's nonsense. The, the accounting method is, is perverse. Um, on batteries, which Elon Musk seems to believe are the great hope of the grid, in fact, you don't need anything else, you just litter the land with thousands and thousands of gigafactories of various descriptions and storage facilities. Is that realistic? Well, I mean, here are the figures which I mean I got from the Pacific National Laboratories in America, looked at the costs of all kinds of installations around the world and tried to come up with a levelised cost for the life of various assets. Um, generating electricity from wind turbine will cost you around about $50 per megawatt hour. Um, to store that energy in a battery will cost you about $300 per megawatt hour. So that's six times as much. And you also got to pay to generate it in the first place. I mean, it, that, that's the kind of cost that battery storage I involves. Um, there are possibly one or two cheaper methods. I mean, what we, we do do in, in this country is pump storage systems, there's a smattering of those around the country which were built in between the 1960s and 1980s to balance the supply of nuclear power stations. That's actually a little bit cheaper than um, uh, battery storage but still very expensive and um, of course you, you need a particular kind of uh, top of more top of more Geology, geography. I, I, I remember it well. One of the trips we did as teenagers yeah. was to the Norwich Power Station yeah, in yeah. Wales. Um, it was very cool, um, and it was uh, fascinating. But we can't build any more of those, can we? There aren't that many sites in the UK that would be suitable. So there are one or two sites. There is another one proposed off Loch Lochy in in the central highlands of Scotland, but it's had trouble attracting investors because you know of the payback time for the investment and the cost of the electricity, you know, in, in the market as we have it, it's, it would be very difficult to earn that money back, earn your investment back, um, because, you know, it's just cheaper to turn on the gas at the moment. But presumably we can just turn on hydrogen instead. Um, well, hydrogen, there's another possibility, isn't it? But let's call it a possibility because, um, you know, I, I think that could well be something for the future where you use surplus um, electricity, wind and solar, you know, when, when your grid can't absorb it, you use it to produce hydrogen via electrolysis of water and then you store the hydrogen and then you burn it when you do need the power. But, you know, it comes down to cost and, and scaling up that technology of electrolysis of water is proving very, very difficult. It's disappointing and um, you know, it's one of those many technologies that net zero requires to be in place by 2050, but which is not currently um, delivering the goods. And otherwise, you provide some really interesting stats and stories about the inadequacies of the current system. So, for example, we're paying £282 million per year in constraint payments for wind farms mm -hmm. not to provide the energy uh, when we don't need it. And the consequence of the intermittency on the gas-fired power is that it peaked in 2021 at £2,500 per megawatt hour uh, for an mm -hmm. hour or so. Yeah. Um, well, well, this is where that um, 
fallacious figure comes from that has been endlessly quoted, and indeed by Boris Johnson when he was still Prime Minister, that um, gas powered electricity is somehow nine times the price of um, uh, uh, wind powered uh, electricity. Which, um, that was achieved at by this. Um, uh, EU funded um, website Carbon Brief and what they did was simply compare the um, cost of the long term guaranteed costs uh, under contracts um, offered to the operators of wind turbines with the next day price of gas powered electricity which is when you have to put on a turn up a gas plant for a few hours to make um, you know, up for lack of wind, and um, I mean, it's like comparing the uh, price of a season ticket on the bus with um, the price of hailing an Uber at peak hour commuter day on the day of a rail strike. You know, it's, it's just not simply not comparable. And meanwhile, the actual wind companies were making out like bandits because 80% of them were on the old renewables obligation system, mm -hmm. such that their profit margins were actually two, three hundred percent or more. They did, and in the end, the government had to introduce a windfall tax on the wind. Have, have they actually imposed that yet? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's been in excellent. Place, okay, yeah. so some. Yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. works on a cap. I think they're allowed to earn seventy pound per megawatt hour, but no more. But, um. So, other problems. I mean, clearly, the all renewable solution preferred by groups like the Green Party require spreading solar panels everywhere, wind farms everywhere, on and offshore. Mm -hmm. um, you note that that causes problems like declining wind speeds, as well as impacts on nature. If you put one wind turbine on a hill, it'll generate a certain amount of electricity. If you then build another wind turbine behind it, um, or it's behind it sometimes, um, that first turbine will steal some of the wind from the second turbine so yeah if you build a try and cover the countryside with wind turbines the the uh, amount they they will generate will reduce um there's also something which um tends to get missed out of the debate is actually there's a global decline in wind speeds it's one of the effects of climate change which gets some um, little disgust because of course it um doesn't quite fit with the catastrophe you know catastrophizing um, narrative that, you know, we're going to get greater storms, greater things. But actually, wind speeds around the world are generally stilling, becoming diminishing. And, um, you know, that, that was also slightly mean that the output of wind farms has sort of disappointed in recent years. So, I mean, to the point of, um, you know, the Danish company, they had to produce a profit warning last year because the wind hadn't been up to, to speed. So there is, a, there is a limit to how much um, renewable energy it's easy to capture and things. That's what tends to get missed out of the bait. We tend to imagine that there's just sort of limitless amounts of um, energy that they're free for the taking if we build enough um, wind and solar, but it's not quite True. So the net zero story on the energy system, a little bit ropey to put it mildly, but if we shift now to uh, some of your readers who may be considering buying a heat pump or an electric vehicle, mm -hmm. what reassuring message of hope does the book give them? <laughs> <laughs> not, a, not a huge one, I would start with a, <laughs> start with a heat pump, Some I say I, nothing against heat pumps, it's a great idea if you you know, I looked into this doing it in my house 20 years ago when nobody was doing them, so it was, it was not really practical. But I thought, well, you know, even if it's producing pollution somewhere else, it's reducing pollution <laughs> in my house. Um, but you, you, you start to look into heat pumps, you get driven back by the cost. And when I looked into it 10 years ago, you know, 20 years ago and then 10 years ago when there were companies doing it, you know, the estimate for my house was sort of £10,000. You look at it now, the estimate's still £10,000. And, you know, it's, it's a technology which hasn't come down in price to anything like the extent which, um, you know, people keep telling us it will do. Um, you know, a heat pump is a 
efficient way of heating a, a, a well-insulated modern building, but um, if you're trying to retrofit an old building with it, you've got the problem that the heat pump will work so efficiently producing more to a lower temperature than a gas boiler, which causes problems in an old house like mine. Um, and then you think, well, could I insulate the house better? And you scratch your head and you look on, well, could we put four inches of insulation on that wall one well, no because that makes the corridor too narrow and then you've got to shift all the internal walls over and you know retrofitting old buildings to modern standards is, a, is an absolute uh, you know headache and I keep hearing you know political party after political party and every single one so as I've read, has come up with this time oh we're going to have a street by street um, insulation program and they just haven't gone and looked at a house you know any houses to see the sort of problems of doing that as for electric cars well again I'd much rather have an electric car I could plug in and then and when somebody markets one where I can drive 500 miles and then it takes 20 minutes to recharge it I'll buy one but at the moment you know you've got cars which will travel 200 well, the affordable ones will travel 200 miles at most if you're just on your own fill them with luggage and people and drive at you know five celsius at 70 miles an hour you know it'll come down to 100 miles and then you know you've got to do a 60 percent recharge and take an hour and so you know you've got to re i worked it out i drive up to scotland about three or four times a year it's 440 miles door to door I went onto this website, ZapMap, and assumed I owned a Nissan Leaf, and so, well, how many recharges would I have to do to get there? And the answer was seven. <laughs> and it, was, it would be one hour a time. And at each, about uh, several of those stops that it had told me, there was only one um, charger, and tough luck if somebody else is using it. <laughs> You know, you'd be stranded. So, uh, you know, at the moment, electric cars are not really practical for those long journeys. If you live in a town, you do a lot of journeys around town, you've got somewhere off street to recharge it, great. You but know. are the Germans onto something in their pushback against the EU's attempt to ban all forms of um, internal combustion engine? Will mm -hmm. hybrids with some form of biofuels provide a potential solution? Well, this is what, I mean, I've think at, at the moment you know what I would be quite happy to buy is basically what's an electric car that's got a little um, engine to recharge the batteries on longer journeys and because you know you're knocking out the peak the peaks and the troughs in demand and you're, you're just steadily recharging you could probably get away with a sort of 500 cc engine to do a, um, a Mazda have actually launched a car like this in the past few months I haven't had a chance to have a look at yet but um, you know if you have a hybrid along those lines you, you've got a practical solution there the trouble is though that government by pre-announcing this ban on hybrids from 2035 has sort of basically knocked out investment in that area and you know which car company is going to invest in a solution like that knowing they've only got 10 years to, to market it and this brings us on quite nicely to one of the central arguments towards the conclusions, which is all of those new technologies are going to cost quite a bit. Are some of the things that we take for granted today going to become purely the preserve of the rich? Well, um, unless there's some miracle um, uh, technological breakthrough or um, the government relaxes the target, it is very difficult for me to see how people can continue, will be able to continue on flying. Um, anything like the, the cost we now do, um, you know, it is very, very difficult to decarbonise jet engines. I mean, it's possible to um, manufacture synthetic fuel, but again, you've got the cost problem. You know, you've got to generate... First, you've got to manufacture the hydrogen. We know that's expensive. You've got to produce the carbon dioxide to, to manufacture the fuel. You know, it's sort of seven, ten times as much the cost of um, producing jet fuel at the moment. And um, given that, you know, the fuel is a huge slice of the cost of running an airline, it's very, very difficult to see how you, you 
you know, you can carry on having an airline industry which is anything like the size it is now if you take the government's intentions at face value. Well, you, you do attempt to describe how a battery-powered plane might work in the book, mm. and you came up with an analysis that said a Boeing 777 would weigh 10,000 tonnes, <laughs> the same weight as the Eiffel Tower. So potentially may not be aerodynamic. That's <laughs> <laughs> what, what I was doing was, I mean, you know, I keep hearing, you know, electric planes are being developed and someone's flown 15 miles in an electric plane. I thought, oh, wonderful, great. You can fly from Golders Green to Beckenham or something. <laughs> but um, for transatlantic flying electric battery solution on our current technology. I'm not, not saying in some future world we won't have um, some miracle batteries, but on current technology, you say, well, how can we store enough energy to get a plane across the Atlantic? And if you um, do it work yourself through the figures, you, know, you come through a plane that would have to weigh the weight of the Eiffel Tower. And of course, you, well, you wouldn't actually get it off the ground. <laughs> But it would be it's a beautiful monster. monument. It wouldn't, it just, yeah. Mm. So, uh, it's an awful lot of things that don't work. What are the not zero solutions? What do we need to do instead? <laughs> what are the solutions? So, well, first of all, um, the, the 2050 target is arbitrary. I don't, so we don't have to get there. And it's sacrilege to say that now in the... People jump up and down on the BBC and, well, you're not even allowed to express that view on the BBC anymore, <laughs> for example. Um, but, you know, adaptation has got to be, uh, you know, a big part of the, the solution. And, um, you know, I'm not denying that the climate is warming and that brings some negative consequences. There are also a few positive consequences, but by and large, yeah, I'm more for taking action on climate for reducing our emissions and hopefully eventually eliminating them altogether. I mean, there are lots of reasons for sort of general pollution why well, we would want to do that. Um, but I say adaptation is um, got to be a big part of the solution. And when you look at what adaptation are we doing? I mean, the most obvious problem for Britain is sea level rise. I mean, sea levels are rising about three millimetres a year. Um, it's a little bit worse in the southeast of London because we're on a, a southeast of Britain because we're on a tectonic plate which is sort of still adjusting from the end of the uh, um, last ice age and it's tilting down in the southeast and um, tilting upwards in the northwest. Um, but okay, we've got a Thames barrier that was built 40 years ago, no real plans to upgrade that. Um, and around the coast of East Anglia, the only policy we seem to have is one of managed retreat, where we sort of say, oh, hold our hands, oh, there's nothing we can do, let's just let all the houses fall into the sea and run inland and so on. And I think, well, you know, if government was actually to spend a bit of money and a bit of thought into... Uh, um, you know, our, our coastal defences and our river defences, we'd um, feel a lot more secure for a lot longer. But in terms of um, reducing emissions, um, you know, I'm, I'm in favour of, you know, a little bit of fiscal incentives to discourage um, fossil fuels and encourage development of, um, uh, you know, carbon-free fuels up to a point. But I say what we've got at the moment is just this massive subsidy and encouragement of wind and solar with no thought put into storage or how we, you know, live with a carbon-free grid. And um, but Is that fundamentally the absence of a good plan or is it an absence of understanding how energy markets actually work and how innovation works? I think it's, it's a policy is just born of panic, really. I mean, if you set yourself a target to decarbonise the entire economy within 30 years, you know, you leave yourself no option but to snatch at, you know, whatever half-baked solutions might be around at the time. And, um, you know, I think you give it a bit of room and, and you, you find that, you know, better solutions will be there in 50 years' time and so on. And we've had this with nuclear fusion, haven't we? I mean, that's a 
prime example of why you should never um, over rely on um, a technology to develop in the way you'd like it to. And there's an infamous comment by the head of the US nuclear um, industry in 1954 and said it is not unreasonable to expect that our children will benefit from electricity which is too cheap to meter. Well, it didn't quite work out that way. I, I guess, you know, in 1954, his grandchildren might still be sort of um, just about on this earth, but um, they're certainly nowhere near um, uh, electricity that's too cheap to meet or even a functioning nuclear fusion um, power plant at the moment. But I would say that is actually still, even after all this time, that is still one of the technologies that it is worth pursuing, persisting with. Um, because the potential um, rewards are so great, whereas um, wind and solar turbines, I think, are going to be a bit of a dead end unless you can crack the storage problem. OK, well, I did detect one piece of good news in what you were saying, which is given the speed at which the tectonic plate is moving, it's slow enough that that Nissan Leaf is going to be able to get from the south of England all the way up to Scotland in time before we drown. <laughs> So on that happy note, uh, questions? Yes, gentlemen in the second row. Uh, thank you. I'm Ian Taylor. Um, with your permission, I'll put three questions into one, if I may, but I'll be brief. Which is, uh, one, um, you, your book really took it from COP26 onwards, but in fact, um, what some people regard as the rock goes back a lot further to the 2008 Climate Change Act. That is what is basically how we've, um, which did at least go through Parliament, but it was virtually undebated for all that. Um, that's what saddled us with the situation where whatever happens, someone is always going to take legal action against it. Um, do you think that the only way ultimately to deal with the rot might be to actually repeal, or at least majorly reform that act itself? Um, number two, um, I'd like your opinion, please, on um, a remark Lord Frost made just the other week at the Global Warming Policy Foundation, where he actually suggested that uh, renewables, or as some of us call them unreliables, um, require backup for baseload, which at the moment can only come from more traditional means of producing power. Um, might it make more economic sense until the technology develops a bit more to actually not spend a fortune on the unreliables and still carry on using some of the old ones. And three, and I will declare an interest here because I am a director of the Alliance of British Drivers, this concerns um, motor and, well, not, not just cars, but motor manufacture generally, um, which is very much, it seems to me, under threat at the moment, which is, um, Synthetic fuels, in one way or another, do seem to be a viable alternative. But nobody is investing in the research, because they don't think it's worth it, because of the impending bans on it and what's coming in under the auspices of net zero. So, um, so really, are we putting ourselves in a corner there, basically? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and if it's all right to have your synthetic fuels in aircraft, why not other vehicles? So I think the second question was very clearly answered, which Ross indicated that we were over-investing in renewables. Uh, the twist on the third question is whether or not the impact of all of this climate regulation is putting people off investing in innovation in perfectly viable solutions, if I may phrase it like that. Yes. And the first question is, do we not have to fundamentally look at the Climate Act? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think at some point we, we will have to look at the Climate Change Act again and um, at least, um, uh, you know, reduce this target to an ambition rather than a legally binding thing. But um, I think politically that's just not going to happen in the next few years. I mean, you know, you look at all the main political parties, they seem absolutely committed to it and will uh, brook no dissent in that policy. So, I mean... I think we're going to end up getting a lot closer to the deadline than before it becomes clear that that will have to be um, revised. But I think revised it will have to be in the end. Um, 
but you know it'll probably be in the sort of 2048 or something we'll say oh can we have a six month extension and then maybe we'll have another six month extension it'll be like one of those things which keeps being put off till the um to the near future but uh, as regards um you know the your your question on synthetic fuels i, I think i think you're absolutely right um this is the problem with which um and in Britain, we've gone further on this than, than, than the EU in, you know, trying to ban um, uh, even hybrids from 2035 and in all internal combustion engines. Um, if you're going to uh, wipe out the, uh, you know, we, we've sort of removed the sort of part of the innovate, innovative field which is potentially there. And um, as I say, you know, a, a hybrid car that's powered now by petrol and maybe by a synthetic fuel or biofuel in future would to me be you know seems to be quite a good solution and one that's ready to run now not doesn't rely on you know a density of recharging points which is going to be very difficult to to put in um but yeah government's sort of um jumped ahead and pre-announced a ban which has sort of precluded a lot of um, developmental technology on those lines. Next question. Uh, I'm going to go gentleman in the white shirt and then the row behind both panellists. Thank you very much. And thank you for writing the book and putting that information out to everybody. Um, I would suggest that taken as a whole, the UK's net zero by 2050 policy is obviously insane. Um, a numerate ten-year-old could tell you that. You don't need a bunch of people in a posh, um, very good think tank, of course, in, in Westminster to get there. Um, the crisis, and the reason we're really here, is the, is the governance crisis around the government, isn't it? Their decision-making process, the absence of proper uh, analysis of it that you referred to, and the fact they won't look at it again, even though it's even more obvious that it's insane. So the, the governance, when I say the governance, I mean if Parliament was working properly with MPs forced to think about it, with select committees doing their job properly and not taking any notice of what is actually just an advisory committee that they have allowed to drive the policy, which is the Climate Change Committee. All the Prime Ministers we've had, dozens of them, have said that it's, if you like, the committee who's deciding <coughs> this, not us. It's a bit like hiding behind the signs in the COVID crisis. So I would suggest that if we turned it into that governance crisis, we'd get a lot further in getting things changed. I don't think there's any hope trying to whittle around. Can, can you condense that yes. to a question? And so one last question. I did have a question, and, uh, but I did want to make that suggestion, bearing in mind what's being talked about. But is nuclear, I mean, we talk about fusion, but actually there's a solution in fission as well, which has been demonstrated to be safe, even if you look at the things that have gone wrong. So. Have you considered the growth of nuclear fission and cheap uh, nuclear stations as well? Sorry to be so long. So we'll take the two questions behind and take them all together. Hello. Um, so I just wanted to ask, um, since you've written about Germany a couple of times and um, over the last year, it's been made very clear that the um, situation was quite um, bad on occasion with the energy supply from, from Russia um, being under question. Um, so my question is the following. Because Germany um, shut down its last three remaining nuclear power plants um, a month or two ago, do you think this process, which sort of finalized the nuclear phase out that started in 2011 after the Fukushima incident, do you think that whole decade uh, or more was a was a decade of um, where emotions led the decision the political decision making process or was this a genuine attempt at um, going towards a, I can't even say greener future because now we're burning more coal but um, let's say a more sustainable future so which one is it emotions or or a genuine attempt okay so wasted decade of nuclear fission so far final question uh, hello. I think you make a very strong case uh, that you know, net zero is not very well thought through. I'm wondering at what point do you think the, uh, there'll be public outcry or public outrage or there'll be some sort of sizable opposition? As you say, uh, all the major parties have gone along with this uh, ideology. 
at? Is it when people can no longer travel on short haul flights within the UK? Is it when you know, fuel tax goes up significantly? At what point do you think there'll be a sizable public outrage and there may be a reconsideration of whether this is a path we should go down? Thank you. Okay, so nuclear fusion, wasted decade, and when is the moment of crisis for net zero? Yeah, um, well, to deal, deal with that last one um, first, um, the pu public opinion is it always comes out the same way on this. Um, you look at various opinion polls, surveys, and so on. When you ask people, do you think Britain should go net zero by 2050, you get a majority say yes, because <laughs> it sounds um, good, it sounds positive, it sounds, um, uh, you know, um, it's what David Attenborough would want, that's um, what it boils down to. But, then, but when you get into the details and you, you start to put some of the implications to people directly, like would you be prepared to give up foreign holidays, would you be prepared to pay more to, uh, for your heating, would you be prepared to give up your car or give up meat and all these things, then you get uh, answers very different, no, 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 no. People want you know, they want other people to solve the net zero emissions. They don't want to do it themselves. And you can you know, nobody is going to um, voluntarily sort of agree to be, well, some people will, but not many people will, are going to voluntarily agree to make themselves poorer to meet a target which only applies to Britain, only applies to 1% of carbon emissions anyway. So, um, yeah, as, as soon as the implications become clear, then, uh, you know, public support drops away. It will continue to drop away. And, uh, you know, what's on the horizon the next few years? Well, I think the first one is going to be um, gas boilers and oil boilers for people who live out in the, or beyond the gas grid like I do. Um, you know, from 2026, we've been told we won't be able to install more uh, um, new oil boiler. Well, uh, you know, what do you do then? A heat pump, if that's the only solution, well, that's £10,000 upwards of, um, you know, investment. And there's a guy who lived in my village who put in, um, uh, he's got quite a big rambling old house, he's put in heat pump, cost him £30,000. And I asked him last winter, how are you getting on with it? He said, well, you know, well, he's got great big oil arger in his house as well, so it keeps warm. But he said, um, oh, that, the heat pump, yeah, that clicks on when the temperature gets down to five Celsius. So, I mean, that's, his house is at five Celsius, and that's after spending 30,000 pounds. Well, you know, that's a big drafty old house. Maybe they work better in other things, but, you know, when that's things, that sort of thing starts to be forced on people, well, you know, and you look at Germany, the government's actually falling apart now over this, um, you know, plan to force people to fit heat pumps on gas boilers by next year. Um, on, on nuclear fission, yeah, no, I mean, I agree. It, it's a, it, it is an established technology which is there, um, available now to provide a, a steady base load. Um, what you can't really do with nuclear fission so much is to balance the wind and solar. Um, you know, gas, <coughs> you turn up, turn down very quickly. Um, to balance the wind and solar, um, nuclear not so much. So, um, um, but, uh, you know, the political problems there, I think, you know, you look at everywhere um, nuclear power station has been proposed in recent years and it's all on the site of existing nuclear power station. I think it would be politically very difficult now to put a huge great nuclear power station in a new area which does not already have one of those stations because you know they were the existing stations were all put in before um, Fukushima and before um, uh, you, you know the U Ukrainian one um, so um, I think it would be uh, uh, politically difficult there. Um, but, you know, as uh, at present, um, where is the uh, nuclear industry going in Britain? Not very far, very fast. I mean, we've got um, Hinkley C under construction. We've got Sizewell C has been given the go-ahead. But those two stations between them won't replace the seven which are... Um, remaining ones which are due to close by 2035 so 
at the moment, what's in the nuclear pipeline is not, you know, it's not even going to retain the, the share of nuclear we have at the moment. Um, Germany is so absolutely foolish to uh, decommission their nuclear power stations at a time um, when uh, you know, we're trying to boycott Putin's gas. Um, absolute madness um, shows the extent to which the ideology seems to have um, ridden over common sense. And of course, you know, that's the case with Germany. They've set themselves a 2045 target, and yet they're closing down their only reliable source of um, you know, low carbon electricity. It just does, simply doesn't add up. And it's just, just absolute panic policy on the part of Angela Merkel, but I think it goes back a little bit further to Gerhard Schroeder, when, um, who later became, you know, chairman of the Nord Sea Stream A um, company. Um, you know, he, it was him who first turned German energy policy towards Putin's gas, which is uh, a bit, um, bit foolish. So, Enigi Wenger, Nine Danker is not yet a protest movement. Um, question right at the back, then we'll come to the two at the front and the gentleman second row. Um, good talk, I'm enjoying it. Um, what is your take on Bjorn Lomborg's attitude to climate issues? And what about thorium as an alternative uh, source of nuclear energy? Until about five years ago, I was under the impression that in terms of climate doom mongering, the worst was over, that we were past the peak. I thought that um, the issue had fizzled out a bit, it was no longer front page news, um, that the worst time was maybe the time when, um, when Al Gore's movie was released. Uh, and then you suddenly had this explosion around 2018 um, of new radical eco movements, uh, the school strikes and Extinction Rebellion, and later Insulate mm. Britain, just so boy. Where does this suddenly come from? Um, so it was seemingly out of nowhere. And why does a conservative government feel the need to react to this? Because they can't possibly think that they'll win over those people as voters. Hello, uh, my name is Jack Soames. I'm the head of media for the Bruges Group. Um, there's a lot to say here, but uh, essentially, one thing we haven't addressed really is PR. And uh, Ross, I think that you've said lots of um, very helpful and impressive things um, today, but um, unless we start to fight this in the media, uh, we're really struggling. And um, so, first of all, I want to say that um, we're really up against it when we're against bunny huggers, tree huggers, and um, you know, we want to save the world kind of rhetoric. You know, that's really, really hard to uh, come up against. So what strategies can we have? Um, first of all, I think lampooning uh, is not a bad uh, start. My brother-in-law, who's a uh, head of investment at a, a private bank, he thinks that by winding a block of concrete up on a crane and then dropping it that this will uh, create electricity and uh, I'm serious, you know, he's an intelligent person. You know? <laughs> um, secondly, um, let's not forget that the environmental movement came out of um, really the Communist Party of Great Britain and they are deeply anti-capitalist mm -hmm. and this is an important uh, you know, blow to strike against them. Uh, thirdly, um, the government just is hopeless about fighting against, you know, the, the kind of arguments that uh, they've ruined the economy and they've spent all the money and all that sort of thing. You know, fighting back, it seems to me to be perfect sense. You need me to stop. Um, it seems to me to be perfect sense to say that they're wasting a lot of money on uh, green initiatives. Um, I'll stop there because I know the, uh, the chair. Uh, to, to, to the final question, please, behind. Um, Thank you. Uh, just a, a quick question. Give, given um, I have an inordinate mistrust of government picking technology winners, which I sh you seem to share, wouldn't it have been more sensible for the government just to publish a sliding scale carbon tax um, increasing over time and then allow private industry and consumers to decide how best to meet the requirement to reduce carbon emissions? 
Thank you. So, Thorium Lomberg carbon tax, lampooning communists and communication strategy, and on a similar theme, catastrophizing activists who are in the Tory party. <laughs> right, OK. <laughs> right, Thorium, I'm going to pass on that. I'll have to... I'll have to learn, learn about thorium power, uh, nuclear power stations. Um, beyond Lomborg, I mean, he f- frequently makes the point, um, you know, he fully accepts the climate's warming and so on, brings certain negative consequences and so on. Um, but he makes the point, you know, you actually, for him, there are two sides of the ledger. There's the benefits of limiting carbon emissions and there's the costs of limiting carbon emissions and what he does what our own government seems incapable of doing it seems to me is to balance those two things and say where it comes out and um, uh, you know uh, Bjorn Lomberg is very good on that and then you know he started out as a environmentalist and well he's still an environmentalist he'd say but um, uh, you know he, he's um, I tell you uh, that's what he brings to the debate, and I wish our own government could do that as well, to balance those two things. Um, sorry, where were we? <laughs> P- PR. PR, yes. P- PR. Well, yes, and wh- why that, that's, uh, you know, this um, movement suddenly erupted then, Extinction Rebellion, as I remember, sort of erupted in the latter half of 2018 when they started blocking streets and so on. Um, they emerged from a group called Rising Up, which is um, a straightforward anti-capitalist group. And it seemed to me that they were this, the climate business was just the sort of latest rebranding of a movement which had been going since at least the 1990s and which had been holding those anti-capitalist demonstrations every May Day in London and so on. Um, suddenly they switched to, subtly switched to the climate and they got a whole load more people on board and, you know, uh, nice um, ladies and gentlemen from the shires were suddenly say, oh, you, you know, you've got a point and um, it is very, very um, easy to frighten people as we found during COVID and you keep sort of stirring up these... Um, tales of unlivable earth and so on and um, people do get you know they get scared they get sort of taken along with it and then David Attenborough made his um, his video nasty which I think was in April 2019 and um, that seemed to gain a lot of traction with people but um, and there's just a lack of people making a point on the other side and um, you know it's a mentioned before the BBC has sort of totally banned it um, with this book I mean I, I was actually almost invited on the Today programme to um, speak about it I was going to be debating with um, Baroness Jones of the Green Party which would have been fun um, but got a call the night before sorry we've had a change of editorial policy and I was no longer allowed to appear <laughs> and, and yet you know, I switch on Newsnight a few weeks later and they had um, an item on the Just Stop Oil protest. And you know what their idea of balance was? They had one person from, they had a guy from Just Stop Oil and they had a woman from Extinction Rebellion. <laughs> that that, that's BBC balance for you. Well, you know, if that is the way you're going to frame the debate, well, <laughs> you know, you, you're shifting it away from any kind of sort of sensible... Um, balanced discussion on this at all so uh, thank you yeah. so that brings to conclusion the formal part of the meeting i'd first like to thank all of the iea book club members here tonight and also the iea's donors uh, without whom we would not be here to conduct events like this well if you enjoyed that conversation why not watch one of these other videos And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way you'll never miss out on a single IEA broadcast.